Good evening, dear friends. I'm glad to see you once again here at our conference and at our section which will be devoted to national brands and to the strategies of their promotion. So together we will speak about national brands and strategy of their promotion. As far as I could understand from the discussions which preceded our meeting, and while preparing for this session, I can see that a lot of uh, my colleagues decided to take part in this session just uh, because of the word brand. Um, probably you will agree that uh, this is a very broad term and there are a lot of definitions of the term brand. So in the beginning of our discussion, I would like to limit uh, the space for our creativity and for our discussion, because today we will speak about original and brands in the sphere of produce, which are based on the human potential, and human potential will be always the, well, probably this is the core of all of our discussions, this is the basis for our discussions, and this is what we value and what we try to protect in this process. Probably before the pres uh, our presenters uh, will share their opinions, I, will, I would like to speak a little bit about uh, branding of territories and branding of uh, products. We would like to speak about regional brands and probably we will be more interested in such, uh, in such uh, directions as, as produce. Uh, so the products and, of course, creativity. Today we have an excellent panel. I will introduce them to you. First of all, I would like to greet Elisaveta Fokina. She is the general director of Museum Tsaritsina Museum. Alek Masyash, uh, this is, uh, he is Deputy Gen General Director of Forum Skolkovo. Our colleague, uh, Walter Reicher, he's Intendant of the Joseph Haydn International Festival in Eisenstadt. Denis Schlesberg, Executive Executive Creative Director of Artonica Branding Agency. And I would like to I would like you to greet Natalia Loshkina, General Director of Simonov and Partners Company. And company in Vitra is reproduced by Anton Bulanov, Director of Corporate Communications at Invitra and a representative of one of the region, Dmitry Karasov. Uh, he is a deputy director of the um, Department of Education in Samara region. Fortune Martin Rowe, counselor and Roman scholar, president of a National Touristic uh, Union. Okay, now it's high time to start our discussion. I suggest Elisaveta Fokina to start our today's discussion. And we know that, most of us know that Tsaritsina, this is a very important and attractive brand, but besides, Tsaritsina is a kind of a platform for other brands. And that is why, Elisaveta, I invite you to tell us and to describe how uh, your brand developed and what kind of platform and what possibilities do you provide for other brands, uh, please. 
Uh, could I start with a small video so that you could understand what Tsaritsina means and probably you could understand it better if you've never visited our place? Okay, let me make some comments. Mm. Historical park, landscape park. It consists of three museums. Uh, and also this is the place where you have children's sports grounds, a river station, a uh, boat station, a unique architectural uh, ensemble of the 18th century, and a lot of examples of architectural Jews. All events are held in Saritsina. New Year and Easter and the Victory Day and many others. In 2019 So I prepared a presentation for you and usually we tell everybody uh, that first of all we are a kind of a museum, an absolutely unique museum and um, it was created in the beginning of the 18th century to commemorate Russia's victory in um, the war with Turkey and um, it is very much associated with the um, a historical figure of uh, Ekaterina II and when we started uh, doing rebranding of our company, for those of you who remember the discussions which were in the beginning of the 2000 about Tsaritsina, everybody was uh, talking, everybody was asking why Tsaritsina should uh, renovate uh, the palace. And for those people who actively were involved in uh, mountaineering and uh, in the ruins of that uh, palace. And for, for us it was really important somehow to conserve that architecture and to do nothing there. And then Yuri Lushko, who was the former mayor um, of Moscow, and he decided to reconstruct the palace and that was done. And, and we have all possible statuses and uh, protection regimes but at the same time we uh, combine the features of a big city playground and at the same time we are not just a playground but uh, at the same time we perform the function of a platform so we invite our invite our citizens to um, for example celebrate different events in our um, Tsaritsina and this year we're celebrating 200th anniversary of Yekaterina the Great and a lot of, pro of our programs are connected with this event. So three years ago, when I became the director of Tsaritsina Museum, the history of Tsaritsina, well, it had some negative associations because it was like a renovated residence and uh, this is a monument, a, a kind of a contemporary monument. And I don't like what um, uh, follows from this uh, idea of contemporary mo monument and that everything in Tsaritsina is commercialized and probably this um, is associated with a kind of a lack of taste and all of our programs are too popular and probably it seemed that uh, you will never change the public uh, visiting you and as if to talk about this um, about the uh, region itself, then it is in the district of Moscow, which uh, 
encompasses about 2,000 uh, citizens. And as for the branding, we are developing uh, not just um, in terms of uh, the city, in terms, in terms of Moscow city, but uh, this brand is really important uh, in terms of the whole country. So we are working with, we had to face this negative uh, attitude and uh, recent these four years we changed completely the repertoire of uh, our programs. We changed our programs completely because we try to introduce a new line and because our main image today, this is uh, the personality of uh, Yekaterina the Great and her image and Baroque music. And y now uh, we see this probably the same uh, guests, but the way they started treating our um, museum, it changed. Uh, they, they really like listening to the music, to the classical music and people believe that it is really important to visit the museum and if i'm not mistaken uh, we in the end of uh, 2018 um, we managed to reach the following uh, figures so about every fifth citizen of our region usually visits our museum and we want every tourist coming to moscow visit not just the key points and excursion uh, key places of interest as Moscow, but also visit our museum. And among our visitors, we have just about 5% of tourists and about 30% of our guests are usually the people who come back to our place uh, to uh, get involved into the educational programs which we conduct. And to, we started initiated a number of programs for children of different ages and 30% of our visitors are the visitors from other regions, um, from other districts of our city. Um, and these people come to us and we try to provide the whole package of our services for this uh, audience. And, but first of all, we try to sell inspiration because Tsaritsina, this is the place uh, for the people who love history, who are in love with history and um, making, underlining this line of the 18th century, we at the same time try to, to tell people about the history of this place and we tell um, about the amazing history of uh, Tsaritsina we tell about Kantmir, that time, uh, and we, then we start telling about Yekaterina the Great and how the park was created. And then, of course, we tell about the Soviet period, because at that time we had uh, the so-called Dachas in Tsaritsina. And then we start telling about the history of our museum. The first uh, uh, and the first director of uh, our museum was Pyotr Koldunov. And if to speak about the local products and local services and the spheres with which we uh, work, we work with professional communities, with artists, and we organized a lot of excursions together with other museums. And now we pay much attention to the development of, of uh, applied arts. And this is a significant part of our collection. And in this sphere, we organize um, projects together with the ceramics uh, museums. And we try to use all, po to invite all possible, to invite all people. Uh, we follow all um, inclusive model in this respect. And we try to create a lot of educational programs together with uh, many uh, city municipal departments. And of course, we uh, promote a contemporary uh, system of hospitality because it seems to us that, for example, what uh, is really valuable for me and I think that it's impossible to develop the brand without this. This is love the uh, people have towards this uh, place, and this is uh, the core of this brand. 
so people who know a lot about this place, people who work at our um, museum, they uh, do not come in vain because they come because they are in life in love with this place, and they can transfer their feelings to this place. You mentioned that you, at the same time, you combine the features of a platform and you provide a number of um, programs. How do you choose the brands and probably culturally specific elements um, for your guests? How do you look for the brands? Because this is one of the most important questions, probably. We have a lot of partners, both commercial and non-commercial. And unification with the strong partners only enhances our internal capitalization, which uh, happens due to our visitors. OK, if you're talking about intellectual and, our, and creative product, for example, I can say about the Festival of Historic Gardens, this year it will be held for the second time. As a public institution, we, in our work, we follow uh, the federal law 44, but I wouldn't, wouldn't like to speak about that in detail. Uh, we hold internal tenders and we see how the topic of, uh, some br of some brand corresponds with the topics which we promote within our festival of uh, historical gardens and we take the period from the 17th century till present time. This year we will show uh, the gardens of our, of other uh, reserve, uh, reserves. Uh, the food market will be made with such brand as uh, the Garden City, because oh, Goratsat, we believe that it corresponds to our vision of a healthy way of life. Uh, so this is quite a wide range of activities, I can say. And uh, the last question in this connection, this search, is it difficult for you or not? I would say it's difficult, because not always during the search you can understand the quality of the product and the quality of the cooperation. I believe that it's important to work with the partner uh, once or twice to understand if you can make long-term strategies, have long-term strategies with this partner, especially it refers to social projects and uh, social entrepreneurship. Here, in this case, you can uh, follow the motivation and achieve good results. Thank you very much. That's quite an interesting presentation. There is a, qu a wide range of different brands, even a personal brand. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. We have seen quite a lot numbers characterizing touristic attract attractiveness of uh, these touristic brands or objects, whatever you call them, 350,000 visitors. This is quite a big number, even for Moscow. And in this connection, I would like to uh, apply to address to our next uh, speaker, Denis Schlesberg. I know that you were one of the founders of the tourist brand. I saw your presentation today and I heard some interesting moments, but I wanted to ask you about a bit different thing. We have started discussing how to search for these brands. There is a view that probably it's not worth searching for them. Probably it's worth to create them. So what do you think? Do you mean either to if we should look for them or to create them, regional brands, local brands. So, yeah, what do you think? And here we go to the discussion, what brand is. This discussion can, can, can be endless. In general, there is a product. It can be what, whatever uh, territory, country, product, service. And there is a brand. This is a kind of image which we form uh, within our target, uh, target industry, uh, target audience, sorry. 
And in this respect, when we speak about regional brand, of course, we should search for regional brand products and then to create brands out of them. So a brand does not uh, appear by itself. Probably there are some exceptions, but in, in general, if you want to turn a product with its original specificity, with its history, into a, a well-known and recognizable uh, image, this is a brand. So you should take some products with the potential and then create some brands out of them. I think so. Thank you for your addition. Now you can get to your presentation. Could I have a clicker? I have a short presentation just called The Role of National Brands in Transnational World. And I decided to look at the topic of national brands in a wider sense, in a broader sense. So, and I s studied some materials. There is a rating of one of the branding agencies in the world, Interbrand, which deals with, uh, which makes some analysis, and they issue annually world rating of brands, best global brands. There are different nominations, and the main one is the cost of the leading or major world brands, top 100 brands. It's not the cost of the capital of the company, but the cost of the brand. Experts in finance, financial experts would understand me. So this is the difference between material cost of the company and the price the product is sold at. So this, it's not a scientific research, I, would, I should say. Uh, this is just a brief look at them. Which of these brands could be called national ones? Here we are talking about the brands which are obviously connected with or associated with a particular country. So I have such a list. The algorithm was like this. I followed the list and I found the first brand which is associated with some country or perceived as a national one. Then I followed and found the second brand. Actually, there are much more brands uh, from the same country, but I just took one of them in order to see how many countries and how many national brands there are in this list. I uh, will not go into detail, but the most American brand from this list is Coca-Cola, not Apple, not Google, not Microsoft, because they are not uh, perceived by us as a, a carrier of some nationality or some national characteristics, but Coca-Cola, uh, they uh, associated with American way of life, with uh, Santa Claus, etc. So I have 13 countries, the United States, Korea, Japan, Germany, France, Sweden, Sweden, Italy, the Netherlands, China, uh, China is a new economy here, then Spain, Denmark, England and Mexico. Probably I missed something, but I guess this is quite an uh, adequate assessment. It's a pity that we don't have any Russian brand on this list. And when we speak about national or regional brands, it works at any level, both on the uh, national level and on the regional level. Uh, why should we create some regional, probably even small brand? To create or to find or express some additional value of a product which is connected with this concrete place. And it has both a social aspect, it enables people to increase their self-assessment, people who live there, associate them with the place, and it has an economic aspect. It is possible to sell a, the, the product at a higher price. So the world is getting more global. We're, we are living under the circumstances of disappearing economic borders. The giants which I mentioned, such as Apple, Google, or Microsoft, these are transnational corporations. And using these technologies, including these technologies, any brand from any part of the world can be available for a customer in any other country in any part of the world. If we analyze these brands, which 
are associated with some national identity and what enables them to preserve this uh, identity and be open to the world. I am an expert on... Uh, I'm looking at the form. I found out fi five aspects. First of them is language. When we read Gucci or Louis Vuitton, we at uh, the language level perceive them as brands coming from uh, Italy and France, then image, uh, part of the country or culture which is expressed through the image and it translates the identity, then integrity, uh, the intensity and volume of communication through which identity of uh, this or that brand is delivered to the audience. It, sh it should be very simple, universal, understandable and readable by uh, any uh, audience in the world, form and language. And the fifth is pursuitivity. If we found some uh, something connected with history, found some communication form through which we could deliver this to the audience, then this value should be uh, supported. If you speak about a brand of a territory and in, uh, try to attract tourists and promise them something, so the tourists should uh, find it there and see it there, only then the brand uh, remains in the minds of those tourists and develop them. I have already asked this question, why do we need national brands? Why do we create them at different levels? First of all, it's clear for the brands, the development of their influence zone is a factor of r growth of their value and their sustainability. The more it is known, the more it is spread all over the world, the uh, more stable perspectives in the future, if we are speaking about business. The world actually needs national brands as well. If we imagine that all our life, and here speaking about branding, consists of such companies as Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, etc., it would be a kind of impersonal world and dull world, and the national diverse brands are necessary for the world without them it's impossible to the world cannot develop any kind of development happens only with the interaction of different cultures and different points of view and as a small uh, illustration for this so here i should note that we are speaking not about territorial brands but about product brands i would like to give an example of the brand i participated in the development of which this is the brand uh, russia during the master class, I spoke about that in detail. This is the project which was chosen at the multi-level uh, tender or contest by jury, by uh, public voting, and it was approved by the public council at Ross Tourism. We developed the concept for this brand with the allusion for the cultural, uh, the culture of Russian uh, avant-garde. Avant -garde. There was a discussion, both professional and exp expert, whether it's good or bad. And here we have different images for this solution, both for uh, the international audience and for the national Russian audience because we wanted to increase the uh, number of tourists from both from outside and internal tourism in Russia. Why uh, avant-garde? Uh, is it good or is it bad? We have certain traditions. But the main idea of this brand, its strategy is expressed in this motto, the whole world within Russia. The essence of, of Russia as a touristic product is its diversity, ethnos, different ethnos, uh, traditions, climatic zones, etc. I will just show how this style is developed in different contexts and through this brand we can translate both cuisine, nature, uh, art, ballet, folk, arts, uh, 
could you could you show the previous slide? This. Uh, Can we consider this as a sub brand? Uh, yes, we can. I just want to say um, when this discussion came uh, to the Danlock, we managed to formulate a very important thing. All the discussions about the tourist brands of Russia get to the uh, national identity. We are of this kind or of that kind, but we put the question in a different way. The tourist brand of Russia is a product brand, tourism is a product. They have uh, customers, they have a target audience. And when we get to the question, where, what, do, what do we want to say about this product and to what, custom, to what kind of customers we are talking about? We want to say that this is a usual uh, marketing product. There are certain criteria which could be used for assessment. Of course, including folk uh, crafts and any uh, tourist brand or territorial brand is actually a territory which cannot exist in vacuum. Its identity is composed of a large number of big, small and medium brands, specially uh, designed or historically formed. And in this project, we finally found that this project was successful, that uh, when from different parts of Russia we had uh, emails, letters, or uh, people who produce something in their regions. And that was the identity, actually, which we would like to use uh, for promoting our original product. So they asked us how could we, how could they do that. So we couldn't answer all of them because the brand is at the stage of introduction. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt your interesting story. I believe that it's very picturesque you uh, depicted uh, how cumul uh, cumulative, uh, cumulative a brand could be. While preparing for today's discussion, Roman Skori said that he would uh, start a discussion with you about the tourist brand. Roman, would you like to give some comments? Probably uh, something about nationality or a historical aspect of these elements? No, Good evening, dear colleagues. Unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, in the beginning of this way, I was uh, the deputy head of Ross Tourism. And I should say that I'm, I think that this product I'm not sure, during the uh, previous session, my colleague uh, said that um, they didn't come to the uh, final conclusion because people were divided, uh, part of the audience were against and part of the audience were for. I don't know where uh, to find these people who uh, voted for because I'm, I've been working in tourism for a long period of time and I don't know uh, we are these people who said that that was a good brand because I think that a major part of people think that our brand about tourism, this is brand about nothing. It doesn't reflect our culture, it doesn't reflect our identity and it doesn't um, reflect why it was created. I will absolutely agree with you um, that it's necessary to define what brand means and why we use it, why we need it. We understand that we need to sell something, and in order to sell something, it's better to make it um, uh, somehow uh, uh, unified. But in terms of this brand, I do not support this idea because I believe that uh, this limits how our country is perceived um, in the world. I can uh, tell, say this for sure, that um, no foreigner will understand uh, what, uh, what is implied by this uh, brand. When I come, for example, to the regions of our country and when I'm asked the question how to develop regional brands, I always say that in the development of regional bases, uh, brands we uh, need as the foundation for development this uh, brand of the region. We must take um, these, 
the specificity of this region itself and the people who work in this uh, region because we understand that for example Kaliningrad region and Vladivostok region they are completely different regions doesn't matter who lived uh, in this place uh, several hundreds year, years ago but still this uh, this is, uh, of course, reflected on the history of the region, and it's not possible to compare them. This makes them unique. The history makes them unique. That's why when I ask such kinds of questions, how to make branding of the region, I usually answer, or, for example, when I'm asked how to develop tourism industry in the region, I start um, asking them, what kind of tourists are you waiting for? So what is the audience with whom you plan to work? So we need to understand um, who the people are with whom we are working and who are to decrypt this uh, code. And um, every country chooses its own way. For example, Toyota, if you don't know, Um, th their brand is very simple, but at the same time, this is uh, the most expensive brands. So the, the, the most expensive brands are usually really cheap. There is nothing intricate on nothing uh, difficult in them. So this is just the company who understood the trends of the development and they changed their production. So if to take into account uh, the experience of the b best market, uh, market sp marketing specialists and best sellers in the world, uh, to whom of course we um, include uh, the United States and uh, then it is possible to sell any brand and this is just the question about the money which you can keep and which you can in invest into promoting of this particular brand. Why do we know why Coca-Cola is so popular? Because the main holiday for us and not just for us but in the whole world this is New Year and Coca-Cola uh, they continue advertising um, they use the same advertisement because this is the eve of New Year and um, of course you're emotionally very positive and you're waiting for a kind of a miracle and these uh, brilliant people, I mean the specialists, they sell this history to you because you associate Coca-Cola with New Year and with all these positive emotions. So the, the perception of the information, it is um, it is performed unconsciously and uh, you so the strategy was very right was perfect so the f the question is just to understand our audience if we want for example to attract chinese the chinese then the eastern regions must be oriented to this to them and And if we believe that, for example, we are to attract not that just the Chinese, but uh, the eastern part of um, Europe, then uh, advertisement uh, should take this into account. And this, this um, type of attitude, it is somehow prejudiced. Um, because I believe that, for example, Japan never believed that, the main, uh, that their priority was the development of tourism. And the number of tourists to Japan, uh, they, it was not uh, big. And then they decided to make it their priority. And last year they had more than two and a half million of, of international tourists. And for us it's just impossible to comprehend uh, this breakthrough uh, they made uh, during such a short period of time. So it all depends on the policy of the country, uh, how the government decide to, to develop and to stimulate this or that um, particular branch. So it is very important to understand what for uh, the, and to understand why the foreigners decide to visit our country. So according to statistics, for example, uh, during the latest, latest year, St. Petersburg is uh, the first place the foreigners choose for their uh, visits. 
And we discussed this, uh, for example, with my foreign in international colleagues, and I asked them, and uh, they associate, associate St. Petersburg with a kind of a museum under the open, uh, under the open uh, sky. Uh, so this is a kind of a part of classical art. Uh, people don't come to us like uh, to, to enjoy high-tech technologies, no. Uh, people come not just to eat black caviar, because the same black caviar you can eat in Paris or in Iran. No, this is, uh, by the way, black caviar, this is mostly associated with Iran, not with our country. So, it's possible to change any history. For example, Americans, uh, they, uh, they created a myth, for example, that shoe arch, the horse, Horseshoe, yes, they implemented, they introduced a kind of a horseshoe and like a monument and they created a whole myth about it and that attracted a, a lot of people to visit that place. And uh, so, uh, once again, our my, main task is just to understand whom we want to see in our country. It all depends on us. And so the formation of this brand uh, this is uh, we, we should be really sensible about it and be cautious because we and we need to attract not just the professionals to this sphere because for example um, when you know to be in a hurry in this respect it, it's not the best option we need to find um, we not to be we need not to copy somebody's ways but we need to uh, find our own unique way we we have our own uh, excellent potential so if we want to sell things if we want uh, something to be associated with russia like for example switzerland is associated with chocolate or uh, watch and this stereotype, it is, uh, con they continue to develop this stereotype, and this uh, story is sold all around the world. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, and probably, I'm awfully sorry, but um, I, I, I will have probably to go, because I'm leaving early tonight. Yes, we understand your point, because uh, the people with whom we work, this is the key issue. But another aspect, this is being honest. And so, uh, talking about honesty of a brand, I would like to address to our next speaker, Anton. To what extent do you believe that uh, pre uh, how local patriotism develops? Uh, first of all, I believe that all the communication industry is not about being honest, but about some... Uh, when you speak uh, what is their good in your region, but you don't say what is their bad. So, uh, honesty is not a business category, it's a category of moral. So we can turn, your, we can open your presentation, and while you are doing this. So as far as we are discussing the tourist brand of, brand of Russia, I would say what I wanted. A few words about what I want to say. So first of all, there is no tourist brand uh, there is no tourist brand exists in nature. It's absolutely a dead-born baby. We can have a country brand, and it is a turn. It uh, faces all the directions. It faces uh, the people who come to study to Russia or not to come. The same way as it's 
it faces the people who invest in Russia, who come to uh, as tourists to Russia, and even though to those who come to make business with Russian companies. In any case, the country brand, the country brand of Russia, is un unified, and then within this brand there are there is its own architecture. Let's call it so, because it's filled with other brands, including s uh, separate brands of Russian territories, uh, n brands known abroad, Russian brands known abroad. We don't have our Coca-Cola, but we can say that we have some brands, Russian brands, which are known abroad, uh, uh, even in political context. For example, Gazprom. If you travel around Germany, you will be surprised to find that Gazprom is a sponsor of uh, football club Schalke 04. And if you come to the best, in my opinion, uh, entertainment park in Europe, which, which is called Europe Park, it is next to uh, 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 Strasbourg, near Karlsruhe, you will find that the highest coaster rollers there are sponsored by Gazprom. So, I mean to say that there is no tourist brand. There is a national or country brand of Russia which consists of a lot of components. And then the question of using this territorial brand for uh, the needs of tourism from the professional point of view is a, is a separate topic. It's not a brand. It's just a, a logo. Sorry to say so. Then, show us some brands. So, we are talking about brands when the organizers and the esteemed moderator, we began to discuss what can we talk about. Uh, from the point of view of brands, I try to answer these questions in my 10 slides. What is the most important? So, first of all, the most important thing is the method, methodology. We can discuss or argue about the definition of a brand for a long time. In my personal collection, there are about 38 definitions of, a, of the term brand. So it will not get us closer to the creation of a good brand. It's all only about methodology, about methods. First of all, uh, we have to understand that in order to make modern brands, we need to seriously realize the new role of brands in society. Traditionally, the role of brand was to stimulate sales, to stimulate commercial activities. The nowadays, we should say that the brands uh, for uh, play more, more range of roles. They have new functions. These are social functions, mo functions, mobilizing functions, educational. Uh, Coca-Cola, which was mentioned here. So Coca-Cola is in many cases acts not as a conductor of their own products, but as a conductor of a certain set of values, which could be called, let's say, American values or liberal values or whatever, especially it is felt in the countries of the third world or the fourth world or fifth world, whatever. For example, when you come to Iran, for ordinary Iranians, uh, a Coca-Cola can is so ideologically uh, colored that except for uh, water and sugar, there is nothing. So uh, for them, when they open a can of Coca-Cola, they feel something about the United States, about the sanctions. So it's not, it's not a beverage for them. So brands play a lot of different functions. And first of all, you have to realize that you don't make something which will sell, but which will have different functions. 
look, when we are talking about the role of brands in modern society, about the interesting roles of, of brands, of course we can single out some interesting discourses, I would say, or the interesting trends uh, where this national brand uh, is uh, leaves and develops by itself. I took only three brands which are quite funny in my opinion and I tried to look at these discourses from the positions of classical psychology. So it's quite funny. First of all, Russian brands are at the stage of schizophrenia so to say because, and they've been there for quite a long time. In the 1990s, at the beginning of the uh, 2000s, when we tried to make Russian brands, they were made in the way to look no, like not a Russian. It is about many industries. That's about shoes, about clothes, about accessories, about uh, uh, whatever, about watches, I made the brands for Swiss watches and I made the uh, brands for uh, Swiss cosmetics and for German shoes. Uh, so I don't know if we should be proud or should be ashamed of, uh, the or of the Russian origin of these brands. But at the beginning it was so. Uh, we, we were ashamed of them, but uh, later on it all cha it changed. In the, in, the, in the middle of the 1980s, all wanted uh, Russian brands. Uh, in 1990, in the middle of the 90s, there were Russian brands. Uh, in the middle of the 10s, especially on the increase on this enthusiasm in, in 2014, you remember probably the Olympic Games in Sochi and the uh, returning of uh, Crimea. And at the wave of this enthusiasm, even the brands which uh, looked like not Russian began looking like Russian ones. And everyone started to uh, express their patriotism. I don't have any statistics in this or any figures in this, but my, my internal feeling, my, my, my feeling is that the companies which uh, made orders for uh, the brands, they are ashamed, so to say, about their Russian origin. Probably you see this tendency uh, more obviously. Yes, we have also came through those stages, this of mimicry, so to say. So it turns out that it's interesting. Uh, as for nowadays, this schizophrenia remains. Either to look like a Russian one or not to look as a Russian one. The second story is about the steroid, steroid uh, attempts of the brand, so to say. These are so, um, uh, there were cases which were discussed in social networks in the last month. The chain of restaurants Tanuki, there, a new director uh, came quite a known person in this, and he started uh, to realize himself there. The Tanuki chain restaurants in Moscow, for example, this is a, cha a chain of Japanese cuisine, food restaurants. And with the first, some Paul, you can see this uh, picture with a fat woman and a slim woman. There was a scandal because it, uh, became obvious that this fat woman is quite well known. I believe she's American and she suffers from some disease. And these photos just show the desire to leave uh, to, to, the full life, uh, to the full life, even if a person suffers from something. So Tanuke uh, was very much wrong when they did so. And even in American Twitter, there were some posts, uh, look what they do in Russia. And Tanuki even had to apologize for this uh, kind of pictures. The second post where you can 
see, I don't remember what is written there. So this is kind of double. Uh, well, it is in big, uh, in ambiguous. In ne net social networks, many women discussed this as a sexist action. Act, uh, uh, they believe that it's not uh, respectful for women. I mean to say uh, that there are a lot of examples. That was just one of them. Sometimes brand st brands start to act as steroids and try to and, and start to act absolutely unacceptably in the society. So I'm moving forward. The third discourse is paranoia brands or paranoia type. And here we get to here we get to original brands. So paranoia type is inclined to form ideas of uh, one's own exclusive character. So it's, it's kind of big idea as a person thinks of oneself as a messiah. And it's quite funny to see when is that in some region, regions it happens with their small brands when some, some small cheese or a small beverage or a small tea suddenly uh, is put under the uh, heavens, up to the heavens, that it's uh, something exclusive and marvelous. Uh, this is quite funny. And now the new role of brand, so I'm finishing now, the new role of brand will request absolutely new branding. And three things which are absolutely for sure should be realized uh, by anyone uh, who is working with branding. This is so kind of trident. First of all, it's methodology, methods, which what uh, is used by modern Russian branding agencies is actually a big shame because this is a methodology which was invented uh, uh, in a shed, so to say, or of uh, 50 years old. So with this kind of methodology, it's impossible to make such a brand. You can make a, a nice picture, but not a brand. So methodology is the first thing. The second, it's, of course, uh, brands should realize themselves as ideologists. Their role is not only to sell, but they have very important social roles and the most successful of the brands must understand that they are carriers of serious, well-formulated, qualitative ideology. Only in this case they will be able to play these roles and will be successful. And the third thing is un unconditionally the priority of strategy because the, pre the presence of because a nice strategy is an absolute precondition for the development of the brand. And in my experience, in my professional communication with other people, I can say that in most of the cases, when regional brands are created, under these brands there are no strategy. There is no strategy, so they don't understand what they will do, how they will do this, and what results they want to achieve. And, there are, and uh, the questions which should have been asked haven't been asked. So I wish everyone success in creating national brands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, and I think that we will need uh, this success. And we should be not just fair and honest, but once again, I would like to underline that we should be cautious. While talking about regional brands, uh, probably the main thing uh, in this, uh, this is the region. And our next speaker, Walter Reicher, probably tell us uh, how uh, region may be may serve as a kind of a starting point in the development of the region. My language is understood throughout the world. This is what Joseph Haydn said to Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and when he said this in 17, 
90. Josef Haydn himself was a brand. He was the most popular composer in Europe, earned a lot of money. The question is, is he still a brand? You know Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley's dad too. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> but he is a brand. He has his Graceland in Memphis, Tennessee. We have Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse has his, it's Disneyland. Can we make a Haydn land? Haydn lived in a very small region close to Vienna, 90% of his life. He was born there, he died there, he worked there, he loved there, he hunted there, and he visited many, many places where his music was played. So I come from this, re from this region. So the question is, can we still profit from this? Can we make a brand out of Haydn who lived and worked there? What has Haydn left us? What's still there? He left us his music, of course, in manuscripts, in first and other editions. We have his letters, we have documents, we know many things about his life. We know where he lived, which this is, for instance, a picture of his birthplace, a contemporary picture from Haydn's time. We know whom he met. Here he plays string quartet with his friend Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Today we still have his music in the concert halls. Orchestras play, play Haydn. Sometimes you can even hear and see an opera by Haydn, which is worthwhile. Publishers sell scores. We have records of Haydn's music. Here we have Swatoslav Richter with some piano sonatas by Haydn. We still introduce Haydn to our children. We learn, we teach his music to musicians, who, who, to people who want to become musicians. We tell the stories about Haydn to our children so that they still know when they grow up Haydn is there. We still have the places where he lived there. We have made museums out of them, some of them. We make exhibitions around, about Haydn. We have even a Haydn train. We have a Haydn hotel. And Mozart has his Mozart balls. We have his Haydn rows. But who earns money with this? Is this the region? who earns the money. How can we make this? How can we make this possible that we, that we create a brand with Haydn and profit and benefit in a whole region? We have producers. The Haydn Festival. So I worked for 30 years for this Haydn Festival. And we even registered Haydn's signature which wasn't easy, but we have it. So we have, we produce, we produce concerts, we produce festivals. There are many ensembles, Haydn Orchestra, Haydn String Quartet, Haydn Philharmonie, they have bear even Haydn in their name. Does this help Haydn? Does this help us in the region? There are record companies who make records with Haydn's music. They don't pay royalties to Haydn because he's dead more than 70 years. They don't even pay royalties to us. So we have to make contracts with them that we get some money when we made this uh, almost complete edition, 170 CDs with Haydn's work. We make publishers 
earn money by publishing biographies. BBC, ORF, other television stations make uh, documents, documentaries about Haydn. And there are, I have here the, the Russian copyright company that try to sell this intellectual rights. We try to sell this too. But this was done just by chance many, many years. So many people earn money, but the region, not really. So we thought, how can we change this? How can we, how can, can we make something which helps us in this region, what is now part of Austria? There are some uh, institutions which we have now since 1993. We have the Haydn Foundation where people earn money. So it's not only to, to get uh, money for, for, for the, the things we sell, but to have also jobs, to want to create jobs where people can make their living with, uh, uh, with these jobs when they can earn money. And this is important. So, of course, I could talk with you now about cultural values, about music, about artistic things. This is everything that's right. But this is not the question of today. <laughs> today is how can we make something out of this legacy, this heritage Haydn has left us. And what we do with the Haydn Foundation is not only to collect things, but to try to, to promote it, to give it to the people, to give people uh, the possibility to have a job. Also, the, the people who just open the door in the morning earn money for it. We have, in Eisenstadt, uh, we have the Haydn Conservatory. So it's a conservatory like many, many throughout the world, but it's called after Joseph, named after Joseph Haydn. And this is already a brand, Joseph Haydn Conservatory. Students from abroad want to go to Eisenstadt because that's the Haydn Conservatory. So this is also important. It, it differs. Eisenstadt is small, it's a village, yeah? It's the capital of, of a province of Austria, but it's a village with 17,000 inhabitants. Why should people go there? They want to start it there because it's called Haydn Conservatory. We have many, many places, many, many museums. We have the Haydn house there, where Haydn lived there for 12 years, and which is now a museum. People come there to see it, to, to, uh, to be there. And who earns money? People who work there. The restaurant close by. Where we get afterwards. Вот, э, про прошу прощения, Вальте, что прерываю вас, но я знаю, что у вас есть пример. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I know that you have examples how this uh, uh, brand can be integrated into commercial projects. Probably your next sl slide will tell you will tell us about this. What we also did is we have, of course, halls, and we licensed Haydn's name to. A, a new hall in South Korea, Goyang, a city of a million inhabitants, close to, close to uh, Seoul, and they have now this Haydn Hall. So this is where we do it. And then we thought, how can we put this into, uh, into action for the, for, the, for the whole region? And we invented the Haydn land. Haydn land is this region, very small. Haydn Tage means the days, spent days in Haydn's land, together uh, with music and other activities. We created the Haydn, the magical Haydn train, uh, because you had to go into the country, from Vienna, from Bratislava, which is close by, from Budapest, you go into this country. Just some example, we even go to Vienna, we say Haydn was there. We brand a place in Vienna, our Haydn land place. We have a palace, which is now in Hungary, 
where Haydn stood there for many, many summers. We make concerts there, we bring people there. We have this countryside, we have these villages, we have all these other places where we do music. We have his mausoleum, where he is buried now in Eisenstadt and, and other places. What is the combination of this? We make corporations, we sell Haydn's name to bus companies with the Haydn bus, to the public transportation with the trains. They have the Haydn train. And what they do now is to this year they start beside the festival with regular uh, products where they bring people into the region where they, where they give them a whole day of experience with this, uh, with, uh, with this Haydn tours. Uh, I call it magically Haydn tours. Maybe you know this Beatles album. <laughs> uh, and I stole the name from them. Uh, we have many winemakers, so this place is a winemaking region. Haydn had a salary, got a salary in money, but beside this he had also the benefit to get five liters of wine per day extra to his salary. Five liters per day. He didn't drink it himself, his wife drank with him. So what we do with this wine? The winemakers, they have the Haydn wine now, they have the Haydn experience. Haydn wrote in his oratorio, The Seasons, the hymn of the, of the wine. <laughs> Hail to the wine. And this is the hymn of, the, <laughs> of this region. So people love to drink wine, to be healthy afterwards and happy. And so that's what we do. We have all these Haydn menus now and, and Haydn and all the hotels who sell Haydn packages. So what we tried to do is, what is there? How can we create many, many different products and fit them together into one, into one uh, project? And this is the Haydn Land Project. Спасибо. Спасибо. Очень интересная презентация. Вальтер, у меня на самом деле. Thank you. This is a very interesting presentation. I have only one question because for uh, it's uh, how long did it took you to implement your project to uh, to achieve things you have now? The thirty years ago, <laughs> uh, when when the Haydn Festival was founded, and then uh, some years later with the Haydn uh, with the Haydn Foundation and. To, uh, but the year 2009 was very crucial then for us because this was the 200th anniversary of Haydn's death. And so this was the culmination. And then we had some troubles too with the owner of the palace. Mm -hmm. And so we, we wanted to go new, new ways and new strategies anyway. Um, and so it took another five years to get everything together, to make the program, to get it in any case, it's very impressive, and the terms of its realization are very, quite short. So, thank you. I believe the reasonable question would be, what do we have in this respect? And I would like to give the floor to our next speaker, who represents one of the Russian regions, one of the regions which took the matches of the World uh, Football Championship of 2018, and I believe the infrastructural branding uh, heritage is a uh, was headache for many regions who, who uh, organized these festivals. But here we have from a uh, representative from the Samara region. What brands did you create? Or probably some solutions you found. Good. Good afternoon, colleagues. I would like to start my presentation that with I, I wouldn't uh, speak whether it's good brands or good or bad. I just say to want to say that uh, brands pro, uh, makes it possible to increase uh, competitive competitiveness of local products. It creates additional opportunities for a track for attracting investments. And not to take your time, I just like to give some examples. The first brand which you can see 
this is the tourist brand of some Samara region. It was presented before the World Championship. I'd like to give some comments about the logo. This is the uh, image. Uh, the, the, this is the counter of this uh, Samara region. It's like a heart and the uh, line there. This is the Volga River and uh, the green color shows uh, its recreational opportunities in the region. It, it was used for promoting tourist objects for souvenirs and later on it was also developed uh, from nine, 2019 this brand is used for marking products which are produced on the territory of the Samara region any organization can get a permit absolutely free to use this mark the, of, or this label of course uh, it is aimed at a customer with a high degree of local patriotism, so to say. But this is a kind of promotion for products and regional producers. The next brand within the region is an investment brand. And here we should say that this is a brand book developed for presentation materials, for investment projects, so when uh, they are uh, presented uh, to uh, some companies or to the uh, authorities and to promote the business image of the Samara region. The next project which was implemented in the Samara region before the Champ World Championship was the project of the History of Champions. The History of Champions of, uh, at the very beginning uh, was thought as a project of creating uh, graffiti or images on the facades of houses and we wanted to attract or involve artists from different parts of Russia who could uh, paint the facades of buildings actually that was the original uh, that was the original idea but then the project was developed um, uh, now we have the logo pattern uh, and then we bought the rights for sketches so that's how it looks like, uh, the building's facades or walls. This model for implementation of the project enables the region, even after the World Championship, to use the marketing potential of this project. Besides, I would like to say that this project was uh, reported about on the federal mass media. It was uh, famous bloggers paid attention to them, this project. Now, this project is one of the nominee of Web Awards in New York. This is a more targeted brand, which we have in our region, uh, Sport Team 63. This brand was uh, made by the Center for Training uh, or coaching teams in the Samara region. Of course, they could focus only on training or coaching sportsmen, but they went further under the auspices of this brand. They, we have a campaign for popularization of sport and healthy way of life. We publish a, a newspaper. We have a mobile applications and we hold different events. We work with mass media and in the social networks. The center also produces merchandising products with the logos of the sports team 63. And they also plan to uh, open a line of uh, drinking water and uh, sparkling water beverages. These are concrete examples. I would also like to touch upon an issue which is important for the cities who uh, hosted uh, the World Championship matches. There are stadiums in all of the cities and considering the uh, wide, wide scale of uh, this event, these stadiums have a high marketing potential and 
that is why not only for the Samara region, but the whole regions of Russia where the stadiums are uh, uh, were built or had been built before that, it is important for those regions not to lose this potential of a big event which draw attention of people from all over the world. So in order to create a brand on the basis of this stadium, it could be the brand of this territory around a stadium or concrete products. Uh, sports products. As for the Samara region, I should say that nowadays we are developing the project of the territory development of 350 hectares around the ter uh, stadium. And we believe in order to, that in order to promote this territory, we would use a kind of uh, name would, which would correlate with the name of the stadium, Samara Arena. Dmitry, I have a question for you. Is it profitable for the region to have to create and to promote its own brand? Yes, I started my speech with this. Probably the brand is not of that high level. Probably it uh, doesn't have a very good strat strategy, but that there are uh, new uh, ideas uh, will entail some other ideas. So, for example, this touristic brand of Samara was planned for a very narrow category of audience for tourists. Nowadays, this brand is used at the at different products, at different goods, and probably it will develop in the future. So, it, it generates some profit. That's perfect. I think that now we came to the came up to this uh, to this part of the discussion when you have to listen to uh, our lawyers and I would like to give the floor to our colleague from the United States uh, he is a patent attorney and I believe he has something to say about regional bra branding so a view from uh, uh, the o from outside the ocean uh, uh, use the microphone yeah. better can you hear me? Cool. Uh, dobry den. Um, I am practicing my Russian, and a phrase I'm working on is this. Ya uh, advokat ver menye. How did I do? <laughs> yes? Spasiba. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I know we've been hearing about regional marks and regional brands and ways to establish them. Uh, I'd like to talk for just a minute about a couple strategies for protecting marks and then in more detail on geographic marks and geographic indicators. So in the United States, we have a couple levels of trademark registration. You can register both at the federal level, nationwide, and there's also a registry in every state and also in Puerto Rico. Uh, most most Americans aren't aware of this. It's worth keeping in mind if you're doing business in just one state. Uh, and there's some, a few other categories where it's useful to register in states. Uh, perhaps you're not eligible uh, to register at the federal level. Or uh, in the case of Puerto Rico, for instance, if you're doing business in Spanish, it's worth registering there in addition to the federal registry. I won't go into more detail on those strategies, but about geographic indicators, uh, under the TRIPS agreement, which um, has applied in the United States since 1996, every World Trade Organization member nation uh, it has adopted this and is bound by it to, to varying degrees, almost all very strongly. Geographic indicator marks uh, indicate a good, uh, or perhaps a service, as originating in a particular region or having some characteristic that's associated with that region. It might be quality, it might be a material or a, a method of manufacture, uh, a, a type of production. Uh, usually it's uh, a geographic origin, but it doesn't have to be. Um, now these goods uh, can't, or the, these geographic indicator marks, cannot suggest or, or be used for a good that 
doesn't originate in the region that's named uh, or have a quality associated with the region. Uh, it can't be used for unfair competition. There are also higher standards for wine and spirits, uh, which I know we heard about some today. And I, I have to say that as an American, uh, when I think of Russia, uh, I, one of the first brands that comes to my mind is Stolichnaya vodka. Now, I, I'm not a vodka connoisseur, and perhaps to you this is not an especially impressive vodka, but for Americans, uh, it's, it's what we often think of and associate with Russia. So I would say um, to, to my uh, esteemed panelists who've been saying that Russia doesn't have strong national brands. You do, uh, in America at least, uh, for Stolichnaya vodka and others. Um, now, uh, if a term is generic in a country, like in the US, uh, it can't be a geographic indicator mark. Um, and that applies whether the term was um, used as a mark or as a generic term before uh, the TRIPS agreement applied or whether it was uh, registered. And in the US, uh, you can register an intent to use a mark and reserve the name for three years before you actually start use. Now that doesn't apply now, but at the time that the mark, or sorry, that the TRIPS agreement went into effect, there were a number of terms that in other parts of the world are geographic indicators, but in the US had already been generic through use. Um, terms like Burgundy and Champagne for varieties of wine. Well, in the US, those are generic terms like sneakers or uh, chair. In, in other parts of the world, in France, I, I think this probably ruffled some feathers, but unfortunately, those are still generic terms and they can't, it's very difficult to make them ungeneric and that hasn't happened. Um, that also applies if the term was generic or in wide use before it became a geographic indicator in its country. Not the case for Burgundy or Champagne, but for others. If, say, there were a term uh, that in the US is now used in a generic fashion just to mean a type of goods, like sneakers, and this is a bad example, but if there, if there were a region of Russia called sneaker or sneakers, you would have a very difficult time making that into a geographic indicator at this point in the US. Uh, unless it had nothing at all to do with shoes. Maybe you could. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind that in the US, all geographic indicator rights are created through <coughs> use in commerce, um, just like any other trademark rights are in the US. Um, in the US, uh, there are currently about 6,400 registered geographic indicator marks. Um, and they can be broken down into both collective marks and certification marks. Uh, collective marks are less common. Uh, they are to indicate membership or for use by members. So if you have an organization or association, uh, maybe a, a union or a trade association, you can create a collective mark for use by the members of that association to indicate that they are members and that whatever goods or services they're providing come from a member of the association or group, um, or to indicate their membership in the group. Uh, it's more common to have certification marks, which are the marks that indicate that a good is from a region or has a particular uh, quality or material uh, or mode of manufacture in it. Um, keep in mind that with certification marks, they are different than other trademarks. So trademarks uh, under US law are used to indicate the source of goods or services. So if I had a registered mark for, say, making canned soup, and you saw my mark on canned soup on a store shelf, you would know, oh, that's Matthew Yaspin's canned soup. It's just an example. I don't make canned soup. Matthew, I'm sorry, but it's all time. Matt.
Matthew, I'm sorry, we are very much limited in time. It's very interesting what you are saying uh, on all this from the point of view of uh, law. But I'd like to ask you, to what extent this uh, legal instruments are available for the uh, owners of these brands, owners of this brand? Uh, do they have lawyers within the companies or they to protect their uh, this they go to lawyers? What is the situation in the United States? You should uh, you should hire a lawyer. You should use a lawyer. You can, and I know that's sort of self-serving advice, but uh, again, um, let me try this. Ja advocat ver uh, And and the reason is that. While trademarks look like they're simple, and it looks like registering them is simple, it's not. The, the law is complicated. There's a lot of subtleties to it. Um, there are a lot of arguments that you can make. Um, and uh, some of the better known uh, certification marks in the US are, uh, are state names. Um, Florida, uh, the state of Florida, has registered marks for oranges, and actually they're a fun example because they also have unregistered marks for uh, a phrase and a song, among others, that relate to uh, oranges, also produce of the sunshine tree. And that was the subject of a lawsuit where uh, even though their marks were unregistered, they successfully defended a newcomer who wanted to use a similar phrase, the phrase sunshine tree, in association, in association with oranges. But it's not just Florida. Uh, the state of Idaho has done this for potatoes, and you might think that's odd, but they are good potatoes, and when you see it on store shelves, uh, you know you're getting Idaho potatoes. Uh, likewise, the state of Georgia, the U.S. state of Georgia, has done this for onions, another agricultural product. Uh, I know, Alexa, you asked me if I brought any props, and ordinarily, when I speak about trademarks, I'd love to bring props. Unfortunately, these are all agricultural products. I didn't. I figured they would have been confiscated when I flew in through Moscow, regardless. Санкционное военное действие. Даже нельзя привести примеры. This is a sanctions war, but you could not bring some regional products with regional brands here to Russia, unfortunately. So you uh, said so the figure six. Uh, uh, 1,400 uh, uh, register, but uh, uh, what, what the level of legal uh, awareness of the owners of the brands, of regional brands? Well, it varies, of course, between different brands uh, and between different marks. Um, but I, I imagine, just a quick show of hands, who here has heard of, let's say, those three examples, Florida or Idaho or Georgia as a source of oranges, potatoes, or onions, respectively. Well, that's uh, maybe one. That's better than I would have thought, um, given that these are all US brands and we are not in the US. Uh, but I think in the US, if you, if you asked an audience of this many Americans, you'd get many more hands. Perhaps not for the onions. Uh, that may not be as widely known. But Florida has a very strong brand with regard to oranges. They have songs, they have cartoons, there are well-recognized images, um, you know, with a bird and an orange tree and a picture of an orange. Not the case for potatoes so much. They're not so picturesque, I would say, as orange, oranges in an orange grove. Uh, but still, I think many of these certification marks are well-known in the US. Um, Others, for instance, uh, Napa for wine. Uh, we're not France, but we have some excellent winemaking regions in the US. Uh, Parma ham, Roquefort cheese, and obviously that is not the US origin. Um, they're recognized elsewhere. Um, another, uh, Cognac, for instance, uh, French brandy, right? Uh, that was not registered, but was still upheld as a what's called a common law mark, meaning because rights are created through use, it was used, it was recognized as a mark and as a certification mark in particular, even though they'd never registered it, which uh, from a branding standpoint is impressive and, and makes for a very strong mark. Uh, 
I'm sorry to interrupt you, but still we have uh, another lawyer who is a specialist in the field of protection of intellectual property. I would like to give the floor to Natalia Loshkina. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. I'd like uh, We've just heard about the United States, but now I would like to hear what happens in Russia and how the status is in Russia with all these things. And what is the diversity of forms and, uh, way, and uh, ways of protection, the IP objects, is uh, are available of uh, for region brands and local brands in Russia. Thank you very much for your question. Can you hear me? I would like to support all the participants and say that our profession is really difficult and it requires a lot of resources. So, for example, you gave an example of shoe horse, of course shoe, and for example, in Perm we have a, a monument, like, like not a monument, but we have a big letter P, but still it doesn't attract people, so the task of a person who works at the market, marketologist, our task is to understand which things will attract people so that these things could really be useful. So all this work is senseless. If, for example, I think that my colleague will agree with me, if this work is useless, if uh, this work is not protected, if it is not packed in, a, in the right form, of course we can create and we can draw something and create something and think of probably some interesting titles, but then we face with the challenge how to commercialize these objects because they need protection if we want uh, these objects to bring profit, they must be protected. If we talk about national brands, then of course we must start uh, from our legislation, national legislation, and first theme which comes to my uh, uh, mind, this is the registration of trademarks, and this, thing, uh, this uh, sphere is very acute, and we have a lot of uh, brands and trademarks, but this uh, dispute between marketologists and lawyers, it still exists, and it always be, because, uh, for example, I thought of something, and lawyers then, uh, then, then they say that it's not possible to register something as a trademark. So, for example, I talked with my colleague, uh, so, uh, for example, the same drawings containing Gzel or Hochlama, and uh, I, I was told that it's not possible to register this trademark because Ross Patent doesn't register these kinds of uh, pictures as trademarks because uh, according to the Ross Patent, uh, these uh, things, these drawing, drawings, they are a part of uh, public heritage and we believe that this issue is not regulated and as for the private, private companies, so according to Ross Patent, they do not register such kinds of drawings. So I think that we need to find a kind of um, uh, agreement, not agreement, but we must cooperate, I mean marketologists and lawyers, and then it will be really, our cooperation will be really effective, whether um, in terms of trademarks or drafts or geographical titles. And another thing I would like to point to, uh, so we couldn't, within the framework of our discussion, we have several Frankly speaking, um, there is a kind of a jigsaw in our head because uh, trademarks, they may be different. You gave examples of Coca-Cola, Louis Vuitton and many, many others. Yes, I can think of, of uh, and create something original, then I can invest to it and create a kind of an image and then all producers will start perceive this as a kind of a national brand. For example, Coca-Cola, this is the symbol of American way of life or jeans, this is the same. But this, this symbol was already created and a lot of money was invented or invested to make it possible. And when we're talking about regional brands, uh, we need to stress that regions try to use their regional markers. And these geographical markers, they can be included uh, like trademarks. They can be treated as trademarks. And then it will grant exclusive rights to the users of uh, these geographical indications. And 
uh, another geographical indicators of origin uh, yes we it has um uh, it has its own specific uh, specific peculiarities and um, in this case, uh, to this to this case, we include only the geographical indicators. For example, Gzel and Volog Vologotska butter and Vologotska embroidery. My neighbor tried to persuade us that Vologotsky tea. Uh, you described it as probably something. No, I was not saying that that person was not crazy, he was not lunatic, but I, I called them paranoid type. Um, paranoid type of uh, branding. Uh, so I wanted to underline that uh, this is not the proper way how to treat this uh, brand. Yes, I understand, but what he does, I mean, introducing this Wologotsky tea, he tries to create a kind of an image of this product. This is not just the usual tea. Probably they are adding something to this tea, and uh, they want to create a legend, create a myth, and I think that uh, the same, these well-known brands like Champagne and Cognac, they originated from the same legends and myths. And I believe that this process, we are really lagging behind uh, in this respect, because France started promoting, for example, their brands 100 years ago, and of course it helped them to result and to excel to this degree. And they are still keeping on uh, doing this work. Because, and they are still searching for uh, for further brands which they promote. Because the task is very simple from economical point of view to preserve um, interest uh, from the population to keep this population, for example, um, in the uh, countryside. And uh, this is the way how they help the region to survive. Because this prevents uh, from, um, this uh, keeps the people inside of these regions. And these, um, these products, they are treated on the part of the government, they are treated like a, they give a special favored condition to these uh, products. And uh, this is the way how this region promote their, their brands and how they survive. And as for geographical indica indicators of origin, very soon we will have something very close to it. Because sometimes you need to underline that your product uh, possesses certain qualities. And of course, to, to, to have this, you need a kind of an expert evaluation. So geographical indicator, this is not just a designation. This is the way to identify uh, the good originating from a certain territory. So this is not just the title. This is a kind of a image which is visualized in your, in your uh, mind. And in this case, uh, the good possesses certain characteristics of quality. Uh, and, but of course, you need to prove the quality of these uh, um, goods. And we need to protect uh, this. But the most interesting thing is that it doesn't matter whether we want or not, do not want this. Talking about the trademark, we should underline that it sh uh, this trademark should be the, prop the property of some right holder. And this right holder should be interested in its promotion because this is not like something which is registered and then which uh, becomes a self-sovereign. No, it always needs uh, to further investment because the more you invest, the more output you gain, the more profit you gain. And um, so then we are to determine the, the right holder of this trademark. For a regional ministry, uh, this is not uh, the proper object. Um, this is not the proper right holder because um, uh, this trademark, once again, this is uh, the way how to make this product more individual. This is something that should uh, work and uh, in our civil, civil uh, circulation, how to make this mechanism work. Once again, trademark should bring money, and to whom? Then the, we have a question, to whom it should bring money? And so this procedure must be very thoroughly thought of. Thank you very much, Natalia. So you made a better 
uh, approach instead of me to the next uh, speaker who speaks about commercialization Oleg we have the full package for uh, package for you you have um, a lot of products uh, IP package uh, brands uh, um, so what do we do with all this there is a big problem for the holder uh, right holder and the commercialization of the so I ha the last uh, presenter has some advantages. So uh, while listening to all the people before me, I changed the topic of my speech. Uh, so I will speak, I will reflect on what I have heard. First thing I would like to mention was the uh, power of brand and its influence on a person. Last November, I was in the Sahara. Uh, I traveled for 350 kilom kilometers and then we ran, uh, ran out of water. We tried to get this water from some wells. Then we tried to filter it. So you can, ima you can imagine what, uh, what taste it had. Uh, on the seventh day, we wanted, imagine what? We wanted Coca-Cola. We, we wanted to pay 50, 200, 500 euros of Coca-Cola because we know its taste. Of course, there was no Coca-Cola and we had to finish our route. So then, about good and bad, and bad in uh, marketing and branding. Uh, we speak about good things, but we hide bad things. I didn't think that I would I would have to speak about branding territories, but I just want to give one example. Once I have uh, once I saw the uh, uh, advertisement of uh, the Guam Island. It's an island between Japan and Australia and the Pacific Ocean. Sanded beaches, cor coral reefs. I wanted to get a ticket and go there. After a short survey or investigation, so to say, I found out that there are 5,000 snakes per square kilometer. So can you imagine that? You have, to, if you want to go through, a, uh, to go for a kilometer, so you would uh, come across 10 snakes. That's about good and bad things. The next thing about tour, tourist brand branding of Russia. I uh, worked in this field and actually, I don't like this idea in principle. This task uh, does not have any solution. Or I agree with the speaker uh, b who spoke before me because we look at the uh, targeted aud uh, audience and uh, the targeted audi target audience of the Kaliningrad region is one thing. The targeted audience in Vladivostok or in Altai, these are absolutely different things and we should not mix them up. In a, uh, and uh, to put this under a single brand, I believe it's impossible. When I was in Shanghai, the exhibition, I saw a pavilion of uh, Tatarstan. It's a very rich region in Russia. So the Chinese people passed by and asked, what kind of country is that, Tatarstan? I also wanted to say a few words about creativity and being provocative in branding and marketing. Everyone knows about the Montana state in the United States. I don't think that there are a lot of people who would indicate in the map where this state is. So the Montana state had a very uh, amazing com brand company. They had a slogan, uh, motive, there is nothing here. And after that, in a smaller uh, script, it was written, but th there are millions of incredible colors which you can see in, in extremely unexpected places. You can find, you can come across wild animals. There are billions of stars in the starry sky. So this kind of creation and pro pro provocation at the same time. Uh, now I will get to the Pskov example. In Pskov we have about 2,000 startups and we help them to develop and to grow into big businesses. One of the stories, probably uh, people who are far away from startup community saw that uh, about Promo Boat. This is a consultant a robot uh, who helps to sell something who serves in airports, on trade centers, trade, uh, trade mall, uh, shopping malls. So the guys use the provocation in marketing. They started with the fact that their robot 
escaped from the production facilities, and it was the, it was the reason for a traffic ja jam in the city. So that was a provocation. Uh, then they uh, had some news that some provocative news, but uh, good it or bad, I don't know. But when the guys were in Los Angeles and their uh, stand, there were a lot of customers who wanted to see this robot. And uh, the number of countries where they say their product increased from 18 to 33. Another example, the last example, the Motorica company, probably not, one, uh, uh, not many people know what they do in terms of building up brands. They do they make bionic uh, prothesis, artificial um, prothesis, and they won uh, com competition from Myri Agency, and they pr helped them to promote them in the international markets. The idea is that startup cannot afford a uh, branding agency because it costs uh, starting from one hundred thousand dollars. So, but in this case, they use. A more, uh, they use more powerful consultants to create the brand of Motorix. For example, Yevgeny Domen, of uh, founder of Splat, Vadim Atimov, uh, who is a brand man, so to say. Well, they work with this project because they are ready to transfer or hand over their knowledge to some other young people who would uh, go to the international markets and uh, uh, get some new positions. Now, a few words about uh, Skolkovo and its pos positioning. So, Skolkovo uh, occupies 400, 400 hectares. Uh, the people who work there uh, love the place. This uh, we have, and our positioning is that Skolkovo is a place for work and living. As for the place for work, that's quite okay. As for the place for living, uh, we have uh, some way to go. And our uh, target uh, target audiences, these are startups. We have three messages for them, very short. We will help you with the development of your business, with growth of uh, sales, both in Russia and uh, internationally. We will help you with the PR, and we will help you with investment. Our target aud audience are investors. You will never find so attractive uh, investment uh, conditions and if you invest uh, to $150,000 so we add the same sum and so and you will get a certain uh, uh, interest in that and then the corporations <coughs> can help with this uh, so, uh, with solving their technological problems digitalization etc and the last uh, thing I wanted to say uh, why is it not so good with brands here in Russia? Even with, uh, the, with the example of Skalkovo, we have 2,000 startups. How many of them do we know in Russia? And how many of them do, we, uh, do they know abroad? We have very well-developed skills. We have good programmers, good engineers. Uh, with industrial design, it, the situation is worse. And the even worse situation with uh, marketing and selling. So we can see the good stories of people. So and probably, I guess, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And probably you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't um, criticize your brand, because I wanted to give this, uh, your brand as an example of a good branding and, uh, for example, Roman gave a number of examples that uh, from uh, Western um, industry that they have successful brands, but we also do have uh, successful brands. And I believe that Skolkova brand is quite successful. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that we've run out of time completely. Martin, you are an expert in strategic planning and probably I have the right to hope that uh, you, you will manage uh, in a very limited time because we actually don't have time at all but your strategic view of regional branding. Thank you very much. I'll uh, keep it short. It's always good to be the closing speaker. 
you have to understand and you have to define and decide once and for all that brands are your most important assets. If you look at the Fortune 500, 80 to 90 percent of the value on the balance sheet probably comes from branding and a mix of goodwill, but there's more like an accounting kind of mix up. So brands are very, very important drivers of, of value for nations, for regions, for products and for services. But I think you are punching below your weight here in Russia. We heard about some of your vodka brands, but I think you have much more potential because brands in the end are stories and artifacts brought out in a very systematic way. And you can only build a brand if you elevate branding to the CEO level. I work in around 40 countries every year. I consult presidents, I consult Fortune 500, Fortune 100, and I work with a lot of governments worldwide. And I see the same mistake. First of all, you need to elevate this from communication towards strategy. This is one of the most important things that a government, a board, and the management team can do is actually to work with your brand. And this is not common, believe me. It is mostly in communication and marketing that you see the owners of uh, branding. So elevate it, first of all, to the CEO level. Secondly, you need to find something which is very authentic. There has to be something about that had uh, your product, your service, your region, that can be proven to, uh, to the world, to the audiences. And at the same time, it has to differentiate in one way or the other. If you're going to build another vodka brand, another region brand, another country brand, it's going it's to be the 40th, the 17th brand that's coming out there. I would strongly encourage you to kind of get rid of Bit, get, get rid of what I see as a bit of an inferiority complex, and I'm not here to criticize Russia in any way. I love your country, I love what you do, but I think you have so much you can bring out to the world. You are punching way below your weight. I'll give you an example of Korea. Korea, just 20, 25 years ago, were really nothing. Uh, 40 years ago, it was at the level of Ghana in Africa. Today, Korea is G7. Why was that? Why did that come about? For a lot of different reasons. One key reason were that the Korean government decided to create, first of all, a very strong country brand, to create a perception of Korean culture, which were unknown to most of us before that, and thirdly, to produce or make sure that they produce some very strong service and product brands. So if you look at Made in Korea today, it has come a really long way. And why is that? That is because the Korean government, they have a ministry. It's actually called the Ministry of Culture, but it's not the typical ministry. They have a budget of half a billion dollars to promote anything Korean, Korean artifacts, Korean culture, Korean music, dramas, you name it. That has become a billions of dollars worth of industry for Korea. Once that is out and people see it, we used to have in Asia, and I lived in Asia for 20 years, we used to have the Taiwanese pop stars, now we have the Bollywood, and now there's a Korean wave. It's called Hallyu in Korean. And that is every one of us in Asia, Euro-Asia, even into the Western world, start to see Korean things, Korean artifacts. That spills into the notion that I trust Korean quality. So would you trust a Korean Samsung phone? Yes, you would, but you wouldn't 20 years ago. Would you trust a Chinese car today? Maybe, maybe not. Would you choose a, would you, would you trust a Chinese mobile phone? Probably, because the risk is less. But once you're going to buy a car, which is a much bigger ticket, I'm not sure about it, but that would obviously merge. So you need to kind of elevate branding to the, to the top office. And I think the most successful regions and countries I've seen in the world doing that, they work in what I call a private-public partnership. That has been very much the case of Thailand. It has been the case of Korea. It is currently undergoing in China. You don't see the face of it, but it's coming. And that's what Singapore has done for many years. That's a reason why a government would kind of encourage local producers, regions, products, and services, whatever that is. I think you have a lot of stuff you can bring out. We talked about vodka, and we heard a lot of other examples from, uh, from the gentleman next to me. There are tons of stuff in Russia but you have not brought it out. You've not branded it. And we talked a lot about what is a brand in the end. There are many definitions I agree on. It. There are a lot of it. My own definition is of a brand, you either 
have some kind of a premium, meaning you, you don't have a generic cost parameter. You cost something more than the other guy and or you drive loyalty. Think about Starbucks. Starbucks is not incredibly more expensive than any other coffee chains in the world, but it comes at a premium. Two, you may go to Starbucks three times a week. That's loyalty. You have to be one of them or both of them. If you're none of them, you're just an incredibly well-known product, but that's not a brand. So you need to distinguish the notion between being incredibly well-known, sometimes for the wrong reasons, or a brand which pulls either a premium and or loyalty. I think you have an amazing chance to, uh, to step up the game. I think it's on the way. We have heard a lot. But I've been coming to Russia on a regular basis. Lately, I've been going to startup village at Skolkovo. I've also been teaching at the Skolkovo School of Management. It's been incredible to meet uh, Russian executives here. I think you have an unprecedented opportunity to bring out more Russian brands, more regional brands, step up the game, prove to the world what you have, and you're not going to reinvent it. You're not going to find it. You're not going to wait until tomorrow because you have it already. You have historical artifacts. You have current artifacts. And I think you have a lot of future content that if you wrap it nicely, you can actually bring it into the world, and you can do that very well. One last example, and I'll wrap it up. Think about Singapore. I don't know how many of you have been to Singapore. Only 93% 93% of the passengers in Singapore Airlines do not immigrate into Singapore. They use Singapore as a transit hub. Nevertheless, people think that Singapore is a very clean and a very nice place. That's because they have created, for example, a national carrier, Singapore Airlines, which I think because they have been flying the flag of Singapore, they have almost helped to rebrand Singapore over the last 40 years. It is one of the most profitable airline carriers in the world. But at the same time, they help to brand the country. Why don't you take one of your national airlines Aeroflot, for a start, you rebuild the airport, you take Aeroflot, and you simply bring out Russian hospitality, the Russian way of doing things, and you have Aeroflot flying to a lot of different uh, uh, destinations in the world. That's one way to showcase to the world what you're all about. Try to look at all the Asian countries today. They all do it. The Koreans, the Thais, the Singaporeans, the Japanese. Why not Russia? I'll encourage you to step up the game because you have so much ahead of you. You have it already. You have a lot of national brands. Why not bring them out? Because I think the world is waiting for you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much, not only for your presentation, but for a high appreciation of the potential which we have. If it's obvious from other countries, it's ridiculous that we can, the, we underestimate that. So now we are absolutely have run out of time. I just want to say a few words in conclusion of our discussion. We have seen that in our country there are a lot of products uh, basing on which we can make brands. We have talented people who can uh, create brands from scratch. Uh, we have uh, very good legislation uh, for protection and uh, intellectual property. And the success of all this is in synergy of all these preconditions or elements. Martin calls us on playing in this game. So I believe that we should play, we should do this with this synergy. I would like to thank all the participants of our panel discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, you are uh, acknowledged ex experts and outstanding experts, and I would like to thank the audience. Uh, I'm sorry I cannot hear the speaker.
by the way, Vadim Dimov, who was mentioned here, is a very good example of how it is possible to brand these toys. Probably you know that in Suzdal he made Dimkov toy, which had has never existed before, but he made this the Dimkov toy, transferring uh, the qualities of his personal brand, not only to his sausages and meat products, but to this craft, uh, but these folk crafts. Я я про себя говорил, вы правы, конечно. Да, да, да. Дым, дым, дымовская игрушка. Да, да. Вы, вы правы, извините, оговорился. Да. Очень, очень хороший пример. Его с учетом того, насколько сильный этот бренд, интересный. Very good example, especially considering how strong this brand is. So, and this toy will be bought because of the interest to the brand, in the brand. So, craft be made out of anything, but this is absolutely different topic. This is a legend. So, thank you very much once again. Thank you.